Okay, welcome to Ready Eden, and uh, this is a short talk about a modern trip to Egypt, and it's a lesson uh, of uh, from Isaiah chapter 30. Um, please follow the mouse, and I'll quickly sort of talk through. I mean, Egypt. When you think about it today, uh, the most known or uh, the most famous aspect of Egypt are probably the the pyramids in uh, Giza, and and it's interesting as well because most likely these pyramids would have been seen by the the Israelites as well by the people in the Bible uh, when they when they went to to Egypt. Um, we've got a couple of other pictures here as well, and and if you think about the Bible, you've got the the great escape from from Egypt, and uh, there's a lot of um, imagery and a lot of uh, a, a lot of lessons are in in the escape from Egypt which can almost be directly translated into our Christian life. You've got uh, the power of Egypt as well. Uh, when you look into antiquity, Egypt was one of the most powerful places in antiquity and a lot of nations relied on, on covenants with Egypt to protect themselves from being raided by, by another nation. And so they paid some tax, some homage, or uh, you know, had just good relations with the pharaoh of Egypt knowing that they are very powerful and that they are very very strong as an army and as, as a nation and as a force to be reckoned with. Um, the other things you may sort of think about Egypt are the, the hieroglyphs, you know, the little paintings on, on the walls and the, uh, in, in the graves. And um, so there's a lot, a lot really with, with uh, you know, just the nation of Egypt and the antiquity of Egypt. Uh, it almost seems to be like the cradle of mankind. A lot of other ancient cultures and civilizations have been vastly lost, like uh, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, um, even when we go to the other side of the continent, uh, which are not quite as old as Egypt, but uh, a lot of information has been lost in just a very short period of time. And yet, uh, some of the uh, artifacts, which may be well over 3,000 years old, uh, are still preserved for us to, to look at them and to learn from them of how Egypt works. Okay, to sum it up, Egypt is quite an important place. Biblically as well, it's mentioned in the Bible very often. Uh, to give you a little pointer, whenever you read in the Bible the word Mitzvahim, uh, it's just another, another term for Egypt. Also, um, um, yeah, you have to kind of think about the great escape from Egypt the way the Israelites grew up in, in that nation and were, were then set free. Now, let me just quickly l sort of talk a little bit about this imagery about um, Egypt, about uh, the, uh, the deliverance from Egypt through, through Moses. <coughs> so the, we've got the story of Moses and he, um, he was called by God to set his people free. And uh, and then we've got the you know the great escape the plagues where where God was calling his people out of Egypt and Pharaoh didn't want to let them go and there were lots of plagues and right in the end there was the uh, the plague of the, uh, the the killing of the firstborn and at that point Pharaoh let them go uh, the Red Sea divided the Israelites went through on dry land and then Pharaoh's army followed them and pursued them. And they, they drowned in the uh, in the Red Sea, so th they really lost uh, a great deal Egypt uh, as the Israelites went. But for us as Christians, it's a reminder and a great celebration of leaving the land of slavery and entering into the land of freedom, leaving the land of uh, the flesh, uh, you know, the world, the worldly cosmos, um, and and going into the kingdom of God, into the land of promise. Uh, so very strong message there and if you read the Bible just keep this in the back of your mind uh, when you read in, in Exodus the uh, the story of Moses and the, the story of the Israelites being set free just keep this in the back of your mind and and think about what uh, uh, what happened in Egypt and and what happened in your life as as you know the firstborn of God uh, died the Lamb of God died and was sacrificed so that you could be set free and that, that you could walk into the land of the promise as opposed to the land of slavery and the land of hard toil and the land of, of flesh. Okay, now Isaiah in chapter 30, he refers to this. And we're going to look at the scripture in a minute. 
And we need to understand a little bit how this applies to us. Now, the Old Testament, I think, very often is it's kind of cryptic. Yeah? Uh, you read it and you read a story, and there's a lot of there are a lot of figures of speech, but sometimes the uh, the whole thing is is a little bit cryptic, and it's difficult to sometimes understand what's really going on and what what is the Bible really saying about me? How can I apply it to myself and my relationship and in my walk with God. So it is very important to um, to to kind of get your head around it and sort of read a little bit between the lines, uh, especially when you read the Old Testament, in, in order to, to get a deep understanding of, of your relationship with God and, and who God really is. And, and the biggest problem I think many of us have is that we've just got a completely wrong concept of who God is and what he wants us to do. Now the Bible is very clear and it tries to to illustrate to us you know, who God is to us as the children of God. And I'm now talking not to people who haven't made a decision for Christ and who have not been accepted by, by Jesus, but I'm talking to the children of God, people who have surrendered their life to God and who have given their life to Jesus Christ to, to be their Lord and Savior. Now it's not exclusive, so if you haven't done this, it's now um, great thing you need to do. You don't need to join a club. You don't need to, uh, you know, uh, um, go through a, a difficult procedure to become a Christian. All you need to do is just invite Jesus Christ into your life and say, Jesus, I want to know that you're out there, and I want, I want you to come into my life. You know, I want to. I believe that you have died for my sins and that you have taken everything away from me, which, which, which separates me from God. And and, and I, I believe you. I trust you. And I want you to come into my life. And to uh, you know, to 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 renew me from inside out. Yeah. Uh, the Bible calls it, and if you read, if you've got a New Testament, go to the to the Gospel of John, chapter three, and and there it talks about being born again, being born of of the Spirit, being born from above. So uh, so that's something you need to really experience and to break through. It's not a great thing in in the sense that. You know, you, you need to go to a special place or do a special thing. All you need to do is just go to God. That's all. Uh, and yet, it's the biggest step in your life, possibly the biggest step you can do in, in your life, and the most important step as well. Okay, let's go through uh, the scripture. I'm first going to go through the text, yeah, and this is Isaiah chapter 30. And I'm just going to read it to you, and then uh, I, I'll talk through the text again, and uh, then the, the talk will be finished. It starts off, uh, Futile Confidence in Egypt, uh, that's the headline, it's not the biblical text, but just the headline for this chapter. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not, not of me, who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who, who walk to go down to Egypt, and have not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be ashamed. And the trust of the of in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. For his princes were at Zoan, his ambassadors came from Hanes. Uh, they were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them, or be help or benefit, but shame and also a reproach. The burden against the beasts of the south, uh, through a land of trouble, troubled anguish, from which came the lioness and lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches on, on the backs of young donkeys, and their treasures on the, on the hands of camels to a people who shall not profit. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore I, shall, I, sh therefore I have called her Rahab Hem Shebeth, uh, which is translated good for nothing. Now go, write it before them on a tablet, and note it on a scroll, that it may be for a time to come, for ever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Therefore thus say, sir, the Holy One of Israel, because you despise his word and trust in oppression and perversity, and rely on them, therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. 
And he shall break it like the breaking of the potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces, he shall not spare, so there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the, the hearth, or to take water from a cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness of confidence shall be your strength. But you would, have, but you would not, and you said, No, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you, pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five you shall, you shall flee. To, you are left as a pole on, on top of a mountain, and as a banner on a hill. Therefore the Lord will wait, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He will be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner any more. But your eyes shall see your teachers, your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left, you would also defy the covering of your images in images of silver, and the ornament of your molded images of God, and you will throw them away as an unclean thing, and say to them, Get away. Then he will give you then he will give the rain for you see, with which you sow the ground, and bread of the increase of the earth. It'll be the fat it'll be fat and plentiful, and that day your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with a shovel and fun. There will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the, the, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of the seven days. And that day the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Okay, this is Isaiah chapter 30 and uh, goes from uh, verse 1 all the way to, uh, to verse 26. And I, I just want to see to uh, a couple of things which are really important. Yeah. So um, I'm going to work all the key points in a minute and sort of try to open up the text a little bit for you. Um, but but um, let me just start off a little bit as I go through the text and then we'll, we'll just summarize the key points. Now, the first couple of verses, um, one thing is clear, uh, God is talking to his children, the, in, in this instance, the children of Israel. He doesn't talk to foreigners, he doesn't talk to strangers, he doesn't talk to people who don't know God, but he talks to people who should know their God. And, and so, in a sense, you could say it applies to us as Christians as well. You know? and, uh, and God warns us, and that's a very severe and a serene warning in here. Where God wants us of um, devising plans or making plans, but not of God, not of the, you know, not by the Spirit of God, but out of our own accord. Now, we can sort of retrieve from the text, and we can sort of see from the text that these guys, the Israelites, have got a serious problem. There's something that's gone dramatically wrong, and they are in trouble, and they need some help. Uh, they need some help, and so one of the obvious Solutions at, at the time is to to go to Egypt and um, to um, to ask Egypt for for help to ask Pharaoh for help. So I guess I would say uh, there might be another army just just about to take hold of them, the Assyrians maybe, and uh, and they want to to slaughter them and and they need help. They need help very very fast. But um, but even though you know going to a big ally, you know from for all intents and purposes, might be the right thing to do at the time to just try and protect yourself. And if you are a king or a politician, and it's your job to protect your people, that might be a solution. That might be a way you uh, you would embark on. But uh, but God says, no, no, it's it's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. Don't rely on your own um, counsel. Yeah. Don't devise plans by yourself without coming to me to God. Yeah. 
And, uh, and then where do you go down to Egypt? Yeah. Which again, as I mentioned before, what Egypt stands for is a secular power. It's a power, um, you know, which, which represents the flesh. Uh, if you if you translate it, it's it's the old life. It's where slavery took place and where where we were enslaved. So we shouldn't really go back to that place to try and look for help, to try and look for a solution. But instead, we should go to God. Okay, that's the uh, first thing. So big warning: don't trust in Egypt. It's just going to be a lie. It's just going to be a you know a pill to try and keep you calm for a moment. But really, it's something which doesn't deliver. It doesn't deliver what it promises. Okay, let me take it one step further. Uh, very often, uh, the easy way out is not the right way. But very often, you could just have a, um, a small lie to try and get you out of a situation, out of a tricky situation. It's not the right way. And it's something you shouldn't be doing, or we shouldn't be doing, I shouldn't be doing. But uh, the way of truth will always supersede the way of deceit and the way of a lie, even though it might end up to uh, create more problems for us. In the short, in the short term. So, um, if we trust in a crooked way, in, in a way that's not right before God, uh, we will end up being humiliated, and uh, it'll not, it'll not work for us. Okay, um, here we've just got a, a little bit of scripture where um, you know people they bring all their stuff on the backs of their camels to the Egyptians to, to try and bribe them into helping into helping them and say, look, we are your friends, we are in trouble, help us, you know, do something for us. And again, we, we do this sometimes as well, where we've got a solution and we, we invest a lot of energy and we invest a lot of money and a lot of resources we have into, into bringing it to the person or to the people or to, to the, uh, the links we have to try and resolve our problem. Uh, uh, in a minute I can give you some answers as well where um, I can see this in the church happening all the time where some some guys they stand up and they say oh give me give me your money and all your money problems will be resolved. I know you haven't got any money but I did the same thing it worked for me it worked for you too. And and it's not the way of God. The way of God is really to seek Him and to, to wait on God see what he is to say, not just to, oh dear, you know, I've got serious money problems, or I've got serious problems in some other area, let's give a lot of money to this preacher, and then God is going to reward me, and he's going to, you know, do something great for me. It may be right, yeah. Uh, I would say nine times out of ten, when these guys stand up on a pulpit, and they are uh, verbally sticking their hand out into your pocket with empty promises, uh, that, uh, that is not right, yeah. Uh, really, what, I, what I'm challenging you, if you ever come across these guys, really pray and don't be manipulated into, into parting with your cash for somebody who, uh, who very often just you know, uses it for a uh, you know, very nice lifestyle, uh, a lot of uh, extra, sort of extra, extra uh, lavish, lavish living. And it's, it's not really of God, and these guys are just uh, uh, very often false prophets, if you, if you look at what these guys are saying, how they use the word of God, and, and what it cannot be. Also, uh, let me sort of take it one step further, I, uh, I've got one example, and um, you know, being German, I, I like to eat sausages. And uh, they're really good sausages in, in Germany, if you know where to get them and where to buy them, it's just really good stuff. Now, living in England, um, the uh, the art of sausage making is not quite as refined, to put it this way. And, um, and anyway, that was a German Christmas market, so I smelled all the lovely meaty products on the, the Christmas market, and I was desiring a sausage. There's nothing wrong with that. So anyway, I went there, I got the sausage, and even though they smelled like paradise, they didn't taste anything like it, and, and they were just a big disappointment. And yet, a couple of days later, the same thing again. And I got fooled the, the second time, the third time, and the fourth time. And I thought to myself, it's just like sin, where <clears throat> you've got a promise which is very, very strong. A really big promise. You know? And it says, look, do this, and all your troubles will be over. You'll enjoy yourself, you'll be happy. But reality is, it, it's, it's just a deception. Nothing is happening. It's just emptiness. 
On the contrary, you feel humiliated, you feel ashamed, and um, and you feel like you have uh, gone back on uh, on God. Um, same as with these sausages. I went there again and again in the hope of getting one that really tastes nice. Nice. The smell, you know, from the charcoal grill, which went across the, and I was working quite close by, and whenever I left work, I could, could just smell all the, the lovely sausage smell. And I don't know whether they got some sausage perfume or whatever, but um, but the real thing just wasn't wasn't like it, and it just didn't taste anything like it. I don't know why. I just don't know why. Maybe they end up cooking. Uh, no idea. No idea. Okay. Uh, now God talks about the Israelites, and He says, "A uh, rebellious people." Yeah. And, and God says, let's write it down, record it, so that it's for future generations as well. And it goes even further. Yeah. And uh, he calls them that they are lying children. Um, they, they lie their socks off. Yeah. And then they go even further, they go to the seers of the prophets, to those who are there to proclaim amongst them the word of God. And they tell them, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Um, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One to cease from before us. Uh, so, just let me put this in modern English. What these guys are saying is, look, you're always you know, talking about these harsh things about God and about all the stuff that's happening to us. We don't want to hear this. You, know, you want to be a prophet, you, know, you want to be our preacher. Uh, we are paying you, we are paying your bill, we are paying your wages, so you better tell us what we want to hear, or else we're just going to go and we're going to go elsewhere. Uh, and and d don't tell us, you know, what God really wants of us, but, uh, you know, tell us what we what we want to hear. Uh, again, uh, I, I find this today so rampant in, in our day and in our generation. Um, there's one preacher who is on, on TV, and all he does is, he's just like a motivational speaker. So he does a little bit of a prayer, and blah de blah de blah He mentions Jesus, God, a few times, and then he's just got a motivational uh, talk, which is all about how good and how lovely you are. And uh, that you will do great things and amount to, uh, uh, to to really great things, great heights, and you'll be happy ever after. Reality is, it doesn't always work out like that. Huh? Um, this life in this world is cruel. It's really, really cruel when you look at what's what's going on, and you look a little bit behind the scenes, and you look at some of the the fates people suffer. And maybe you are one of those guys who who hears these uh, pleasant speakers and tries to sort of lull people into a false sense of security and yet um, you look around and you see that life is anything but, but like that. Also you have to bear in mind, yeah? once you are children of God, once you are child of God, once we are children of God, it's not our job to enjoy ourselves, to have lots of toys, to, to rise up to uh, you know, a life of pleasure, but it's our job to be ambassadors of God to try and obtain righteousness, uh, obviously through Jesus Christ in the first instance, to be justified before God, but also to, to, to endeavor to live a good and righteous life, worthy of the people of God. And, uh, and that's not easy. That's not easy at all. That's very, very, very difficult and it's very, very hard. And I think that a lot of people really, really struggle with this and they really have got a hard time to, uh, to, to embark on this route. So it's a lot better and a lot easier to you have somebody talk, talking to me sweet nothings all the time, and um, and and to um, you know be lulled into into this false sense of security. One way you're going to look back and you realize that you you missed the purposes of of you know the purposes of God in your life. And, and very often the um, the way to to reaching out to, to the potential God has got for me, what God wants me to do. Is, um, is through hardship. Character building is always through tribulation. Uh, look in Romans, you know, tribulation will come uh, in your personal life. You will have hard times, but sometimes they are necessary to just taking you that one step further so that God can use you in a great way. Now, and if God uses you in a great way, it doesn't mean that you'll be driving a BMW. It might be the country. It might be that you'll be doomed to your bicycle. And... Um, that uh, the people will kill you because they can't stand the word of God. You know, you speak to them out there in, in the word. This is what's happened to the to to uh, the prophets in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is what's happened uh, so many times in church history that people rise up for God, 
and the result is they, they get persecuted for what they believe in. It's, it's, not, it's not a pleasant uh, promise, but again, we are not looking for a good life here on earth. And if you do, don't become a Christian, you know, become a, uh, something else. But we are looking for eternity, and we are looking to, 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 to do business. Uh, not, not with money, not with money, but with the creator of heaven and earth, with the guy who says, uh, there shall be and there is, with, uh, with the light, uh, with the guy who said, there shall be light and there is light, uh, with the light of this world, with the most powerful creator of the universe. We are doing business with him. We are not, we are not in for a little bit of pleasure here and there. Don't get me wrong. I know that God loves you. Uh, and God wants you to enjoy your life as well at the same time. And I think despite hardship, despite hard times, you will enjoy your life and you will have a reward here on earth as well as in, uh, in the life hereafter. But, um, but pleasure seeking is not what we've been called for. And when I listen to these preachers, and it's, it's, I think it's a scourge of our generation, and these guys become more and more powerful because people just love to hear what these guys have got to say. We give them lots of money, um, you know, making their ministry so perpetuating, sort of expanding further and further. Uh, now, it's not about that. What it is about is really, you know, seeking God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And, and to be single-minded and single-hearted for God. And, and to just go for it. And to be good to the people around you as well, and to, to be a witness and a testimony to the living Word, to the Word of God, to Jesus Christ, to, to a people in a lost world, doomed to eternal damnation, so that, that many of them may see, may hear the Word, and may be rescued. Okay, therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this Word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. And he shall break it like the breaking of the potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so there shall not be found among his fragments a shard to take fire from the earth or to take water from a cistern. Now, what, what is this all about? We've got a problem here. Huh? And so I mentioned before, the Israelites, they've got a problem, you know, an army is besieging them. They want to go to Egypt to try and resolve this, to, uh, you know, have, have them help them and have them um, you know, deal with with this problem of the the other army that's giving them a hard time, um, and they trust in oppression and perversity, yeah, rather than into the word of God. And I had to think about this, you know, this this little expression, and I thought, when I look into our generation, you know. It's there. Uh, there's something which has been lost. I look at my parents' generation. So my parent, my father was born in 1930, and uh, he has been through the whole madness of the, uh, the Second World War as a, as a child. Um, but he's also been after the, the Second World War, where you had this, you know, people were very humble. They had been through horrendous times. In the 50s, they were just putting their feet back together on the ground. They were making a living, having something to eat. But but there was something like an integrity within people, and there was something where right was right and wrong was wrong. If somebody was in trouble, they would have helped him. If somebody um, did something horrendous to another person, they would have stopped them. They would have gotten involved and, and done the right thing. If somebody needed help, they were there. Um, today, I don't think it's happening anymore. Yeah. Um, I myself, I'm going through this at the moment, that... Um, the companies say they don't care about people anymore. They don't seem to care about people. Um, I'm, obviously, I'm generalizing, which is very dangerous. But I see this more and more that um, profit is the the new god, yeah. and anything is okay to try and create a profit, and uh, because it makes the company more stable, it you know puts it in a better position. And so, if it means you get rid of some people or you uh, send people into unemployment. That's okay, that's, that's fine, providing the structure and the profit is there. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a victim of this uh, myself at, at the time, and, and I've seen a lot of my friends have been through the same pro uh, process, where um, in, in some sort of corruption, people at the top, they bump up their wages, they secure their positions, and people lower down, they are, they are shed. Uh, the, the, foot, uh, the foot warriors, they are just sacrificed. You know? 
and, um, and that's a good thing as well, you know, the work they're doing, they, they give it to other people, so they put more pressure on them, and they've also got the, um, you know, the, the example, you know, look, if you don't do what we want, want you to do, you'll be the next to be out the door. And I think today in our, our environment, the whole concept of being good, being just, being righteous, doing the right thing is, is no longer there and is being replaced by uh, some dogma of um, I don't know, capitalism, uh, of, you know, if you can make some money out of people, why not make it? And, and perversity as well, where, where suddenly anything goes, anything is okay, and if it's to your own advantage and you can... Um, you know, further yourself on the back of somebody else and on the back of somebody else finding his, uh, his doom and his, uh, you know, his misery, that's okay, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, as I said, I'm generalizing terribly and, and it, it may, may be a little bit unfair, but uh, all I want to say is I've seen something, something shifting from a generation uh, where my father was living in to, to, to our current generation where, where really anything goes, nobody cares about anybody anymore. And uh, the king is money, the king is profits, and anything is okay for the sake of profits. And uh, yeah, morality goes out of the window. If I look at the banking crisis in America, a big problem was that people were selling mortgages knowingly to uh, clients who they knew would not be able to afford the mortgage later on. But because they've sold the mortgage, they got a bonus, and that, that's all they counted to them. So they were making a good life on the back of people who would have to default on their payments, and then a few years down the line would, would enter into a huge misery. And then obviously it set the northern effect where a lot of banks were about to fold up and uh, we ended up with the debt crisis. And the usual story as well, through a good sense of perversion, some people got very rich out of it, and a lot of people suffered a, a great deal and, and lost everything they had. Okay, and anyway, God talks about this, this, this iniquity. It's, it's like a like a wall, you know. A, a bulge in a high wall, a breach, you know, a broken wall which is ready to fall. Now, what does this mean? Now, when you look at a wall, a wall is, tends to be very, very stable, Providing the static is okay. If the wall starts bulging, which means it, uh, uh, on the radio as well, so if you're look, looking at the video, you can see my hands moving. But instead of having a straight wall, it sort of starts bulging out, and, uh, and the whole static is slightly upset. And if it goes beyond a certain point, the wall is just going to collapse in one go. It will just go down, and then uh, that's the end of the wall, and, and, and the wall becomes useless. Now, what are walls there for? Walls are there for protection, uh, to keep up a building, to keep uh, bad things out, good things in, to find some shelter, possibly. So there, there's a whole issue about a wall. Now, if your wall falls down, your protection is gone, your shelter is gone. Um, if you've got a structure which, which the wall is keeping up, the structure will be destroyed as well. So um, it's a big problem. Your wall goes down. You're, you're unprotected, without shelter, and possibly without a structure which you use for, for whatever purpose you had have, you have for it. Okay, so, problem here. So what God does is, He looks at us, you know, and we are talking not to, to the world, He's talking to His children. We choose to rebel, we, we tell the seers don't see, we tell the prophets to shut up, we just, we just prefer to listen to the smooth, to the smooth talkers, and the, the, the smooth, um, people, the slickies, who tell us everything is fine, you know, God loves you, just do what you want. Um, and we go for oppression, yeah, where we think, okay, it's fine, you know, I'll just give other people a hard time so that I'll be better off. And perversity, where, where I just change the truth, start twisting things. Uh, I leave righteousness, righteousness and justice outside and, and don't worry about it. You know, I just turn it in a way that is beneficial for me, for me, myself and I. Yeah. And, and because we have turned this way, what God does is He takes our protection, our shelter, you know, the wall that's around us. And a little crack appears and it starts bulging. And then suddenly in one moment the wall just tumbles down and it is gone. And we are vulnerable, widely vulnerable. Okay, it's Isaiah, that's what Isaiah is talking about. So, I mean, the lesson so far is, you know, be careful. You know, if, if, if God speaks to you, 
listen to God very carefully. If, if they're prophets, I mean, prophets sounds um, a little bit lofty, but I'm talking about people who proclaim to you the word of God. And it, it could be anybody. It could be a mother. It could be um, somebody God has placed in your life to talk to you about his word. And, and in the past, I could always identify that I had a couple of, of people in my life and I learned that, that if they said anything to do with the Word of God, I, I better listen very carefully because somehow I felt that God had placed these guys in my life and, and, and they were looking over me a little bit, making sure I was okay, and, and not very often, but sometimes I said a word and it was spot on, especially with the, uh, the benefit of hindsight. And I'm sure you will have the same. You will have uh, some people God has placed in your life, and it may not be necessarily you know, the, the great prophet, you know, who stands at the pulpit, but it might be a grandmother, it might be a granddaughter, it might be a Christian uncle or, or somebody else. Yeah. God has put in your life. And, 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 and prophecy basically means that it is a word of God, you know, spoken to you and to your situation. And, and it, it doesn't come like, oh, you know, I've got a vision and the Lord says, thus shall do that. And, and so... It's not like that. It might just be like a simple thing. Look, I think there's something wrong with you. Uh, is this right? Are you okay? You know, it might be something like that, and that might be where the Word of God comes into it. Where people are guided by the Holy Spirit to speak um, God's Word into your life. So just listen out and look out for these people. Also, um, this talks about people who no longer look for the counsel of God. They just, they just don't want to know. They do their own thing. They make plans to go to Egypt. Egypt is your flesh. It's your old life. It's your... Uh, your old, you know, your old alliances which you, you might have had before you were a Christian. Uh, is doing things on, on, under your own steam, not under, you know, directed by God. And again, I mean, whatever the things are you're doing, you might be identical, maybe in another instance in your life, you've done them under the direction of God, but they're not right for, for this period in your, in your life, for now. So, I mean, to sort of sum it up, what you need to do is you need to go back to God, go back to the rules. You know, see God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and and listen to those people around you, you know, who are guided and who are uh, um, who are sort of moved by the Spirit of God to to see whether they've got a word for you. Yeah. And it, it may not be blatantly obvious. It may not be you know, thus says the Lord, but it might just be a nice kind word in your ears, you know, where where people give you a warning or uh, you know help you on the way you know, to, to try and correct you. And don't tell them, don't say this stuff to me, but listen carefully. Ultimately, whatever they tell you, you know, weigh it in your heart and weigh it before God and then either accept it or reject it. But, but you should bring it before God. The Bible is very clear. Any prophecy should be tested. And um, you have to do the same. You have to test it against the Word of God, against the Bible, and you have to test it against uh, what you... What you sense God is saying to you. Uh, okay, let's let's move on a little bit with this talk. Um, and here's the answer as well. What God is saying, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. In the NIV it says, but you would have none of it. Um, okay, simple point, you know. Israel is uh, the children of God in, in, in Israel and Judah, they are they're under pressure, you know. There's the army outside, they're about to, to face uh, their demise. So the answer is, let's go to Egypt, get the Egyptians, get them, get them, get them. Because we, we need to re resolve this problem. But God says, no, 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 don't go to Egypt, it's not right. Egypt is not going to help you. But, uh, but come to me, come to God. Yeah, that's what God is saying to these guys at, at the time. And, and he says, in returning and rest. Yeah? In NIV it says, in repentance and rest. Now repentance is a turning back to God. So... Uh, repentance is not just a one-off thing which you do when you come to Christ and then you don't do it again. But repentance is something which you do every day. You do it every day, you know, in, in your life. And, and that's repentance. Uh, something which is again and again. When you get up in the morning, you say, Lord, I'm turning away from everything in this world and I'm turning to you. And I want to follow you. I don't want to follow my flesh. I don't want to follow what the people of this world are telling me I should follow, the humanism, liberalism, or whatever, uh, nihilism, yeah, whatever whatever the, this world is preaching to you, but you follow God and not this world. And then the next one is this rest. Just relax. Relax in God. 
and and let and wait for God. Wait for Him to act when you're in trouble, uh, and allow God to, to have my. I mean, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and I've had many difficult situations. And I'm about, as I mentioned before, I'm about to face another really difficult situation in my life. But um, but I know that the key, and I've, I've, I've noticed this very often in the past, very often I thought I'm, I'm in a cul-de-sac, I'm in a dead-end road. Um, I'm going to the end and I can't go anywhere, I'm finished. You know, I may as well take my car, run it in front of a tree and be done with it. That, that's what I thought a few times. Uh, you know, bad business decisions and, and things like that. But what I found is that uh, I go to the end of the cul-de-sac, I can't turn back, and then suddenly God opens another road. And it might not be, you know, a road of glory, you know, paved in gold. It might just be a tiny little snicket, you know, a little path I can escape on and I can get out of the situation. And I couldn't see it before, and I only saw it the very last minute. And I know that if you wait on God and you trust in God with all your heart, heart and all your life, there will be an answer. And God is going to push you through it. And I don't care what the situation is and how serious it is. We are talking about God. Now, God is not um, a, a joke. To, and many people, many Christians, I believe, they, they treat God like, you know, he's so limited, he can only do a few things here and there, but he can't go any further. Now, God is a God who, who says, there shall be light, and there is light. Uh, in, in Latin, it's called ex nihilio. He is a God who creates something out of nothing. He knows you inside out. He knows every cell in your body, all the hair on your head is counted, which in my case is not that hard, but uh, in some other people's cases it's very difficult. But he knows the exact number at any one time. That's how intimate God is. And how big is God? Um, I mean, I, I sometimes look at the cosmos and I look at the calculations about how many light years are between our galaxy and another galaxy. And you see a little dot in the sky and you, you whip out your telescope and um, pointed to a dot and you see it's a galaxy. It's, it's like our galaxy, but it's umpteen light years away. The Bible says that God has created them for His glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. So He didn't do it, you know, to create aliens, or extraterrestrials, or anything like that. And to be fair, I don't believe that there are any. But He just He just created them for, for fun, for His glory, for, for His aesthetics, for creating something interesting for us to look at. And, and I'm absolutely amazed how big God is. So you're a little tiny problem, you, in comparison and contrast, which I know from your perspective might be the biggest thing you're facing in your life. You know, might be the existence of, of yourself, your family, your wife, your, your children. Might be a, a disease or an illness, which is really rough and really hard. But, but you can trust in God. You can rest in Him. You can, you can rest in Him that everything will be okay. And that from God's perspective, it'll be, it'll be right. And I want to encourage you at this point, and I say, look, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to, to the charlatans you know, to, to look for help, but instead go to God. Uh, again, it goes here, no, we will flee on horses, Asher, you, you shall flee. And this is the thing, you know, the, the enemy is in, at the door. And uh, the Israelis, uh, they thought, okay, that's it, you know, they can't take this anymore. These guys are going to kill us, so we need to, to sit on horses. Egypt is down the road. Let's go to Egypt, right like the wind, and, and we'll find some refuge in Egypt. No, it's not the answer. It's not the way to do it. Uh, and, and the answer is, despite the horror in front of you, despite the doom, the doom and disaster that you can see right on the, uh, over the city wall, you look there and it's there, it's there staring in the eye. And you might be able to see the white of the eye of your enemy, you know, who's after your life and all he wants is to kill you. Uh, but, but God says rest. Repent, you know, turn back to God and rest. And in that you will find your strength. Be quiet and have confidence in God. And that is your strength. And things will happen you can never imagine. And things will, will, will go to plan and they'll be amazing. Um, and who knows, maybe if you experience something, I, I would love to hear testimony. You know, if you go through the situation and, and something happens and, and you just take this scripture at its face value and you just repent or return to God. And again, repentance is not, oh, I've done something terrible, you know, please forgive me, but it's, it's more than that. It's every day, every moment, it's just turning back to God, turning back to God, turning back to God. That's repentance. You know, leaving sin and word and all this stuff behind. 
which is going back to God, going back to doing the right thing, going back to doing the right thing, again and again and again. That's, that's what's meant here. And, and resting in God, being quiet before God, and letting God be your confidence. Okay, next one. Um, and you do this, and we've got the answer here as well. And, and it says here, you know, Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Uh, in the NIV it says, God longs to be gracious to you. He wants to be gracious to you. He wants to reveal his mercy and his kindness to you. He longs for doing this. He waits for it so that he can be merciful to you and that he can be gracious to you. God is a God of justice, but blessed are those who wait for him. Right? It's a problem. Uh, God is a God of justice. Many people in this world think that God is a God of love without justice. So anybody, you know, will be okay and, you know, he'll go to heaven one day. It's not the case. Yeah. God is a God of justice, infinite justice. If you have done the tiniest thing wrong and you don't find, um, you don't find a redeemer, somebody to redeem you, to pay for, for your misdeed. You're doomed. As simple as that. People who shall dwell in Zion in Jerusalem shall weep no more. He'll be, he'll be very gracious at the sound of your crying. When he hears you, he'll answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, that your teachers will be will not be moved into a corner anymore. And we find this, you know, you find a difficult situation and you've got adversity and you've got affliction. And sometimes God does it so to, to call you back to him and to, to adjust your walk with him. Not always. Sometimes you just get adversity and affliction for no reason whatsoever. In the case of Job, he was a good man. He did everything right. He didn't do anything wrong. And yet he still got it in the neck. Um, sometimes we don't do anything wrong and, and stuff still happens to us. We, we get terrible diseases. We, we have got serious situations. But, but, but all we can do is really, you know, be quiet before God. Rest in Him and then rest before God. Put our confidence in Him and turn back on a constant basis, you know. Go to His throne and say, Lord, help me. What, what is going on here? I don't understand it. I, I want to go to Egypt, but I don't really want to do it. I want to go to you instead. Please help me. Uh, do this. Um, and it goes further. Your teachers will not be moved in a corner any, anymore, but we will see them. Our teachers, we will hear them and see them. The ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way of walking in. And that is the word of God. Your, your teacher is the word of God. The Bible is not that hard to read. And I would challenge you to, to spend time in the word of God every day. And, and if you don't understand it, to, to talk to people about it, ask questions about it, and, and try to find an answer. But don't just... Don't just trust these TV preachers or, uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I'm not much better than, than, than they are. You would probably see, either hear me on the radio or uh, on YouTube. But, but even don't trust me. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm trying to encourage you and the point I'm trying to make is go into the Bible, go into the Word of God, go to the source and, and be inspired by, by the Word of God. And then you will hear a word. A voice behind you saying, "This is a way of walking in," and and then it'll be a lot easier for you to understand what is good, what is right, and you know what is not quite right, the way you should stay away from. And it says, "You also defile the covering of your images of silver and ornament of your molded images of gold, and you throw them away." Now we've got silver and gold. We've got images. And a lot of a lot of us, we we put our trust in silver and gold. And, and again, it's nice if you've got a wallet full of money and you go to a restaurant and you don't have to worry about paying it or a bill comes through the door and you don't have to worry, can I pay it, can I not pay it. It's nice if you are in that position. Uh, I know many of you are, many of you are not. Um, the, the problem is it's, it's one of usage. It's nothing wrong with silver, nothing wrong with gold, nothing wrong with money. It's just the way we use it. For some people, money becomes the, the sole objective in life. And they want to get as much as possible of it to buy themselves good things. Very often, they haven't got the time to enjoy the good things they've bought with the money. But, but the attitude we need to, to, to get to, and Paul talks about it in the New Testament, and it is we, we should own, or we should possess like we didn't own it. Yeah. And in the end, we, we don't belong here as Christians. Our home is with the Lord. Our home is with God in eternity. Uh, whatever we have here is just uh, borrowed anyway. We don't belong here. We are not citizens. Our passports are basically telling a lie. 
You are not German, you are not English, you are not American, you are not Russian, but you are you belong to the kingdom of God. And that is your, your primary passport, your primary identity if you are a Christian. All the rest is secondary. And and we are just here for a short time and then we'll be gone and, and then we'll have to face eternity with with God. And now if you come over to us into the kingdom of God and you accept Jesus in your life, uh, you, your eternity is going to, going to be secure. And, and I'm not talking about a group, a church, or a particular confession, or a, a movement, or whatever. I'm just talking about a relationship with God and you reaching out to Jesus Christ. And that's all. That's really all, all, all you need. You don't need to be Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, or any of these labels. You can, and it can be good. Some of the groups, they do really good work. and and uh, you get you get good encouragement from 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 going to them but but that's what it's not about it's all about one person and relation with one person and that person is jesus christ okay and we carry on and god says look you know you sort yourself out you come back to to god then he will give rain for your seed and he will increase the bread uh, you know life will be fat and plentiful you'll have your cattle and things will be fine, you know, the rivers will be, you know, giving streams of water, uh, got lots of light, and, and everything will be fine. And this is what God is basically saying, you know, get get the, the first things right, and the rest is going to drop into place. And the first thing is always, you know, trust into God, seek God, forget about Egypt, don't trust in Egypt, don't trust in the alliances in this world. They're going to fail you anyway. Uh, the, the insurance company, you trust your, your fortunes in. They can fail you. Uh, your job, your employer can fail you. Your, your politicians, they will fail you. Um, this world is just a really terrible place when you look at it. And when you look at it historically as well, there's been barely a generation where you could say, yeah, they really had a good life. And I wish I would have lived in this generation from uh, you know beginning to the end. And it would have been nice. I would have really enjoyed life and I would have had something out of it. So it's not like it. It doesn't work like that. There's hardly any generation there when you go through history. Every generation that had major wars, major diseases, major um, major nightmares to deal with. Yeah. And it's it's hard. Life is hard. Okay. I'm just going to summarize and I'm going to go through the key points and then this talk is done. Um, very often we've got the wrong concepts, wrong ideas to resolve a problem. Um, and this is, this is us talking to us as being God's children. Um, why wrong concepts, wrong ideas to resolve a problem, you know, by, by God's children, um, very often leads to wrong actions, bad behavior, and we create more problems. You know. Going to Egypt, you know, trying to try the easy way out, you know, the way which is bypassing justice, righteousness, uh, respect for God, respect for our neighbor, um, you know, bypassing all these things might, might sometimes be the easy way, but it's not the best way, and it, it will create more problems for us. The result is we, we will have divine correction and, and judgment and discipline. And we can see this in this text as well that God wants his people. He says, look, you know, you do this. One guy, he will beat a thousand of you. And five, you will all be done. Um, so it's a warning. But then at the end, we've got the great promise and we've got divine restoration and a return to peace, glory and tranquility. Now we can bypass the whole thing um, from right at the top. I've got my mouse here. Uh, if you follow the cursor from the wrong concepts and the wrong ideas, if we if we try to get this right, and you only get this right by by really being quiet before God, listening listening to what God is to say, and listening to the prophets of God, and and uh, let me take it one step further: it's listening to the Word of God, which we have in the Bible. Um, if you get this right, then it is less likely for you to to follow wrong actions and bad behavior. There's less need for you for divine correction, and uh, and the way to divine this restoration, return to peace, glory, and tranquility is going to be shortened uh, a lot. Uh, so save yourself a lot of trouble, save yourself a lot of grief, and really come to God today, even as a child of God. You know, go into this attitude through life where you repent every day. With repentance, I don't mean to to beat your breast and say how how ugly and how sinful I am, but with repent, I'm, I'm meaning something positive. Um, in, in repentance, you go back to God. 
and you surrender your heart and your life to God and you say, Lord, here I am. You know, help me to go through this day. You know, really, really challenge me and, and put me through and let me do the right thing today. Uh, we've got the new year. 2014 is on the horizon and we've got new visions, new ideas, new hopes. And my question to you is, what is your vision? What do you look forward to? What problems are you facing? How do you aim to resolve them? And problems are going to come, and we've seen this with, with, uh, with the, the Israelites having uh, most likely a foreign army or something on, on the doorstep. Uh, you will have crises, and, and, and I know I'm looking for another crisis in my life. It's all pre-programmed. And uh, I'm standing at the cliff edge, and I've got a car at full speed going behind me, uh, pushing me over the cliff edge. And all I can do is I can just trust God and I can say, Lord, you know, let, let there be uh, something there to catch me, otherwise I'm finished. And I'm there as well, it's not just you. So uh, we all have to face this. And it's difficult times as well, which, which we're in economically, and especially in some countries. It's almost impossible to get a job, but, but God is the God of the impossible. And he can make the impossible possible. And he can find a way for you. Uh, it might not be a way of glory, but it will be a way of meeting your needs, a way of ensuring that you can survive this crisis. Uh, we had a look at Egypt. Egypt is man's answer. It's about riches, about power, about control. It's about alternative religion, a mysterious worldview. Uh, we've got all this stuff going on today. We've got the New Ages. We've got the, the alien cults. Uh, we did some talks on, on Red Eden. Uh, recently about all the, the the alien stuff which is going on these days and people fall for it and they think oh it's really great we've got these creatures from outer space and they show us the way i don't believe that uh, these guys are from outer space i believe they're just evil manifestations leading people astray and bringing great deceptions and uh, it's happening all over all over today and it's, it's sometimes shocking when you talk to people sane people the ideas that come up with and, and how they've abandoned God and they follow some, some crazy concepts which ultimately is going to get them into hell. But uh, it's, it's hard. The biblical view of Egypt is it's a place of slavery, of idolatry, of world power. It's, it's a flesh, the equivalent of the flesh. It's the old life, doing a man's way. And, then, and not God's way, but doing a man's way. That's what Egypt is from the, the Bible's point of view. It's not about man's answer, not about riches and power, something else. People are rebellious, deceitful, unwilling to listen, telling the prophets normal visions of what is right, tell us pleasant things and illusions, stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel, with the Holy God. Uh, they rely on oppression, you know, just press the other people a bit more to get a bit more money out of them or whatever they want. And then we've got the broken wall, and you can see the broken wall here. You can almost see like a slight bridge there. Now this wall can collapse at any time. You know, it just needs a little bit of a little bit of wind or something, and suddenly there will be destruction and your shelter, your protection, and everything is gone. Now, God is your wall around you. If you seek God with all your heart, this wall is going to be insurmountable. The enemy can come and he can put all his all his forces against this wall. You will not be able to get through. But if if God removes the wall around you, you become very vulnerable. The answer is, don't rely on Egypt. Seek God in repentance and rest in quietness and in trust. In the end, God longs to be gracious. He will bring restoration and He will meet your need. That is the answer. Okay, I've talked an awful lot. I hope you... Uh, let me just go back to the first slide. I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk and got something out of it. Um, the message is very basic. It's really, you know, watch out what you're doing. You know, don't, don't rely on, on, on things which aren't right before God, but instead seek God instead, even if it costs you more, even if it's harder to do so. Okay, God bless, bye-bye, and uh, thanks for staying tuned and for listening.